the paleo ploy when everything old is new again welcome to the presentation that takes a closer look at the arguments behind the paleo diet largely pushed by lauren cordain author of the paleo diet and the paleo diet for athletes while the trend to go paleo has swept through the nation riding the more general anti-carbohydrate sentiment this presentation will examine the underlying premise of the paleo diet namely that the addition of starch to the human diet is responsible for many of the chronic diseases that plague modern civilization including the epidemic of obesity what is the paleo diet the question seems obvious but it is in fact something that is not clearly defined a popular version of the paleo diet, and the one that we will be addressing throughout the presentation, is the one marketed by Dr. Lauren Cordain, a professor at Colorado State University and author of the book The Paleo Diet and the Paleo Diet for Athletes. The premise of his version of the paleo diet goes something like this. Since the beginning of the Paleolithic period, 2.6 million years ago, our ancestors lived off meats, vegetables, fruits, and nuts. Only with the advent of agriculture around 10,000 years ago, did our species begin ingesting large amounts of starch in the form of grains, legumes, and potatoes. Because our Paleolithic ancestors did not eat starchy foods, their diet is really the diet to which we are genetically best adapted. Like all diets, the Paleo diet is highly restrictive, with a rigid set of rules stating that grains, tubers, and starchy foods are strictly off-limits, as are dairy products. The foods that are allowed are lean meats, fruits, vegetables, as well as oils, nuts, and seeds. This is an example of a typical paleo pyramid that appears on numerous sites on the internet, although this version is not specifically endorsed by Cordain for the simple reason that it is difficult to put Cordain's concept into a pyramid shape. For one thing, the percent of calories derived from the food groups that compose the paleo diet would not form a pyramid shape. Cordain recommends a diet that is around 35% protein, with the remainder of the calories coming from fats and fruits and vegetables. This is important because the pyramid on this slide is impossible for any human being to follow on a daily basis. Protein cannot form the base of the human diet because a diet that is any higher than 40% protein is toxic due to our limited capacity to process nitrogen. Some paleo pyramids put fruits and vegetables at the bottom of the pyramid, which is also virtually impossible for any human to achieve simply because these foods are not calorically dense and the amount of apples, radishes, and carrot sticks a person would have to eat to derive the majority of their energy from them would be so large it would be unrealistic to follow on a daily basis and most definitely uncomfortable. Homo sapiens are not gorillas and do not have the same digestive system that allows for the kind of gut volume needed to eat fruits and vegetables in enormous quantities. In other words, humans eat bananas, but gorillas eat banana trees. Understanding this difference is essential in understanding human nutrition. The purpose of showing this pyramid illustrates how nebulous the concept of the paleo diet is from the start. Not only are there different versions of the pyramid, but the entire pyramid exists as a diet that is next to impossible for our species. Any diet devoid of starch must rely heavily upon fat to make up the remaining calories for reasons I just outlined. But you won't see any pyramid with fat at the base because such a diet would be unmarketable, and that's why these non-physiological pyramids appear all over the web, selling a diet that is impossible for people to follow given the limitations of their own biology. With starchy foods clearly defined as the enemy, the paleo premise continues by claiming that with the rise of agriculture came the rise of the major chronic diseases that plague modern civilization. Here, Cordain throws the net out quite wide by implying that the addition of starch to the human diet could be implicated in anything from arthritis, heart disease, obesity, diabetes, to multiple sclerosis and acne. The list of consequences for deviating from the diet of our Paleolithic ancestors is long, with very little in the way of concrete evidence or mechanism given for such assertions. In a letter to the editor of the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, Cordain writes that, quote, 
Numerous epidemiologic data support the notion that increasing westernization and industrialization in human populations is associated with a greater incidence of chronic degenerative diseases. It is almost axiomatic that changes in diet and activity levels initiated by westernization and industrialization are largely responsible for these health disorders. Of course, no scientist would disagree with such statements, but such statements are broad and full of countless variables. But blaming a diet rich in starch from grains, legumes, beans, and potatoes for the increase in modern chronic degenerative diseases occurring post-industrialization is hardly rooted in evidence. Forcing populations to move from working on farms and enjoying a wide variety of foods to working long hours in unsafe conditions inside factories isn't a condemnation of starch. It's a condemnation of industrialization. Exploiting the majority of a population and forcing them to work in low-paying jobs that resulted in them being malnourished does not speak to the nutritional inferiority of a starch-based diet, but rather the inferiority of an economic system that forces people to live in a system of wage slavery that leaves them unhealthy and malnourished. The relationship between socioeconomic class and access to a healthy diet is nothing new and still exists today. The Japanese sailors forced to subsist on white rice experienced thiamine deficiency, unlike their wealthy superiors who enjoyed a more varied diet. However, this is not a condemnation of white rice. It's a condemnation of a socioeconomic structure that prevents classes of people from gaining access to the basic nourishment their bodies require. In his 2000 article appearing in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition titled Plant-Animal Subsistence Ratios and Macronutrient Energy Estimations and Worldwide Hunter-Gatherer Diets, Cordain presents detailed evidence on what modern-day hunter-gatherers eat, especially with regard to the ratio of plant to animal food gathered and the macronutrient distribution of these foods. Cordain begins his abstract with the following quote. Both anthropologists and nutritionists have long recognized that the diets of modern-day hunter-gatherers may represent a reference standard for modern human nutrition and a model for defense against certain diseases of affluence. This opening sentence is an unacceptable first premise for several reasons, two of which are immediately apparent. First, he implies that there is a consensus among anthropologists and nutritionists to treat the diet of modern-day hunter-gatherers as a reference standard when this is simply not the case. Second, there is no evidence that the diseases of, quote, affluence result from the application of sound modern nutrition principles. There is, however, plenty of evidence that many diseases of affluence are associated with the abandonment of these principles, an abandonment that is common in modern society. For example, Americans tend to eat very few fruits and vegetables, far less than even the most conservative recommendations. Our diet is high in poor quality fat and low in fiber and many micronutrients, all of which affect diseases of affluence. The term diseases of affluence itself is highly problematic because ultimately not everyone in Western society is affluent. Millions of people in the most affluent societies face hunger on a daily basis and earn a meager salary which plays a huge role in what foods they are able to purchase. The cheapest foods are not necessarily the healthiest foods, or foods that are recommended by nutritionists. Cordain thus conflates what modern society forces upon people with what nutritionists recommend as best for health, when in fact these are two entirely different diets. It is only with this understanding from the outset that we can investigate the value of the Paleolithic diet. While no single diet represents all modern hunter-gatherer societies, in the 229 Cordain's group studied, certain dietary trends emerged. For example, 73% obtained 50 to 65% of their subsistence from animal foods, while 13.5% obtained comparable levels of gathered plant foods. No hunter-gatherer population studied was entirely or largely dependent upon plant foods, however, 20% are highly or solely dependent upon hunting or fishing. This varies by latitude, but in general, modern hunter-gatherers consume a greater portion of their food from animal products than from gathered plant products. 
Of the total plant foods gathered, 41% were fruit, 26% were seeds and nuts, 24% were underground storage structures, tubers, roots, and bulbs, and 9% were leaves, dried fruit, flowers, gums, and miscellaneous plant parts. Plant food macronutrient values were 62% of energy from carbohydrate, 24% from fat, and 14% from protein. Hunted animals would have been anywhere from 2.5 to 20% fat by calories. This is important because body fat percentage of hunted animals affects the behavior of hunter-gatherers in searching for food. The hunter-gatherer diet was generally around 35% kilocalories from protein, close to what would be considered toxic and exactly what Cordain recommends. Yet he states the following, The avoidance of the physiological effects of excess protein has been an important factor in shaping the subsistence strategies of hunter-gatherers. Excess consumption of dietary protein from the lean meats of wild animals leads to rabbit starvation a condition described by early American explorers which initially results in nausea, then diarrhea, and then death. The amino acids that make up protein contain nitrogen, which must be removed before they can be used for energy. Nitrogen is converted to ammonia and ultimately to urea, which is excreted. Thus the amount of protein that a human can consume on a regular basis cannot exceed the liver's ability to synthesize urea. Hunter-gatherers faced a dilemma the constant threat of protein toxicity. This would lead them to seek more concentrated sources of carbohydrate and fat. According to Cordain, though increasing plant food consumption seems like the simplest idea, the kilocalorie payoff for the effort involved is greater when eating more animal fat. Cordain's conclusions from his data analysis is that because modern hunter-gatherers eat a diet high in animal protein and fat, that this type of diet should then serve as the reference standard for all Homo sapiens. A plant-based diet is not considered optimal by Cordain because hunter-gatherers preferred animal fat to gathering more plants due to the amount of energy it takes to gather such foods versus their caloric density. Cordain postulates that because these hunter-gatherer societies show little signs of modern chronic diseases, which is not entirely true, as we will see later, that this could be attributed to this type of diet. Using the same data, one could easily construct an alternative conclusion that makes more sense given the fact that agriculture has led to the development of large, successful civilizations. Cordain's reconstruction of the plausible diet of our Paleolithic ancestors is actually the best argument against applying the Paleolithic diet for a modern society. An important driving force in the search for food for our Paleolithic ancestors was the avoidance of protein toxicity. So what is the permanent solution to this problem? The answer is all too simple. Cultivate plant foods that experience taught our ancestors were richest in carbohydrate and fat, particularly carbohydrate, which would be the easiest to manipulate. It makes more sense to conclude that it was the very nature of the hunter-gatherer lifestyle that led us to agriculture, the ultimate adaptive response that would guarantee the survival of the species. The Paleolithic diet glorifies the hunter-gatherer diet as the ideal and vilifies farming and agriculture as the downfall of our health, when in fact these innovations most likely saved our species from extinction. From his analysis of modern hunter-gatherers, Cordain makes several other leaps in logic. The first of which is that only a diet that avoids carbohydrates found in beans, legumes, potatoes, and grains is protective against obesity and its related diseases. The obesity epidemic is a very recent phenomenon. If Cordain's hypothesis were correct, then our entire species, since the advent of agriculture, would be characterized by obesity, and this simply isn't the case. Quite the contrary, in fact. Cordain ignores the many societies that have maintained leanness on a high-carbohydrate diet. The Tarahumara Indians have a health record every bit as good as the societies examined by Cordain, but were farmers, and thus had a diet of about 75% carbohydrates. Why isn't the diet of the Tarahumara Indians the reference standard for modern nutrition? 
By ignoring civilizations that enjoyed the same level of health but were tied to agriculture, Cordain tries to present hunter-gatherers as unique in their freedom from obesity and overall superior health when this is simply not the case. Asia has long used rice as a staple food and has managed to avoid the Western scourge of obesity. Only with the recent rise of fast food in the big cities of China and Japan has obesity begun to rear its ugly head. The fact that obesity now threatens this part of the world has little to do with the rice that has nourished them for centuries, but rather has everything to do with the emergence of a new pattern of eating that traded traditional boiled starches low in fat for ones that are deep fried. The main problem with Cordain's analysis of modern hunter-gatherers is his exclusion of groups that don't fit his hypothesis. There are numerous examples of non-westernized societies that do not suffer from obesity-related illnesses, but these are never once mentioned by Cordain because they rely on farming for food and as a result have a high-carbohydrate diet. It's easy to be right when you can ignore all the data that does not fit with your predetermined conclusion. And what of the Paleolithic hunter-gatherers that did use starch? Cordain admits that there is no one diet that can be called Paleolithic, and that some hunter-gatherer populations ate the starch they gathered. Why is their diet considered inferior when they enjoyed the same level of health as other hunter-gatherers? Another problem with Cordain's overall premise is his desire to equate all non-Western societies as hunter-gatherers. This false equivalence allows him to ignore any society that relies upon agriculture and is also lean and fit. The Tarahumara Indians are known for their long-distance running abilities, a feat that could not be accomplished by a diet devoid of starch. Starch and its crucial relationship to athletic performance is something we will examine when we discuss Cordain's Paleo Diet for Athletes. Critical to selling the idea of the paleo diet is its ability to make the dieter feel as though he or she is simply going back in history to a time when our ancestors did not face modern maladies like obesity and type 2 diabetes. But this idea of invoking our ancestors is a complex concept that brings up several questions, namely, which ancestors? Or maybe we should start by asking which paleolithic period is relevant, upper, middle, or lower? Are we talking about the time of Homo erectus? Homo habilis, a four-foot-tall hominid with a brain capacity one and a half times that of a chimp? What about Neanderthal? Neanderthal lived during the Paleolithic period and had a diet that was 96% animal products and had bigger brains than we do. Of course, Neanderthal never made much progress beyond stone tools like we did. And as for being free from obesity and other chronic diseases that plague modern society, the amount of physical labor needed to secure adequate food would have made obesity next to impossible. And what does that have to do with the inferiority of a carbohydrate-based diet? The short life expectancy of Neanderthal would have prevented the appearance of many of the chronic diseases Cordain is quick to blame on grains and other starches. What about our own species appearing around 200,000 years ago? Are we to believe that Homo sapiens living during the Middle Paleolithic era never ate starch? Of course they did, and no one within the scientific community would deny this, including Cordain. So is this when all our problems began? If our Paleolithic ancestors ate starch and didn't suffer from obesity, then what does starch have to do with obesity? There is no indication that we were a healthier species back then, we had a shorter life expectancy and less time for certain diseases to appear, combined with a harsh lifestyle that weeded out anyone too weak to withstand such tough conditions. What about the gatherer in the term hunter-gatherer? Because Cordain puts the energy density of starch with that of leafy vegetables, he privileges the gathering of nuts over vegetables as it would make little sense to expend great amounts of energy gathering food that yielded little caloric value. But this idea is problematic for a couple of reasons. First of all, roots and tubers are much more calorically dense than leafy greens and shouldn't be grouped together calorically. It is silly to think that a tuber, resembling the modern potato, would be similar in energy density to a radish. Secondly, the idea that roots and tubers didn't play a significant role in the diet of our Paleolithic ancestors is disputed by Harvard primatologist Richard Wrangham, who asserts that roots and tubers, termed underground storage units, 
were in fact crucial to the diet of our ancestors during this time period, providing a much needed source of calories from carbohydrates. The paleo diet claims that we are not genetically adapted to a diet rich in starchy foods and that they are unnatural foods that do not fit with our evolutionary history. As we have already seen, our ancestors did in fact eat starchy roots and tubers, but what about grains? Since the paleo premise implies that our species was actually harmed by the development of agriculture, what role did grains play in our ancestors' diet? It's true that many of our ancestors didn't eat grains, but it had nothing to do with their supposed ill effects on our health. Our ancestors couldn't have eaten grains because they didn't know how to cook them to gain access to the starch inside of them. The ability to boil water was a crucial innovation in our evolutionary history that allowed us to take advantage of an entire new food source. It is interesting that any scientist would make an argument that essentially condemns major advancements like the ability to boil water and cook grains, which eventually led to the ability to cultivate these grains, a practice that led to the emergence of large civilizations. Why not condemn the use of fire and cooking altogether? Such reasoning is about as useful as saying that the ability to walk upright led to all our modern foot, knee, and back ailments. The truth is that grains aren't any more unnatural than any other food source, and as for our Paleolithic ancestors not eating them, the fact of the matter is they didn't know how. In our culture, we rotate food villains like the clothes in our closet, and gluten has become the latest target of a media frenzy aimed at defacing the value of this protein found in wheat. With celebrities like Miley Cyrus calling gluten crap, or Jenny McCarthy claiming that a gluten-free diet helped to cure her son's autism, gluten-free is now a massive advertising gimmick appearing on everything from pizza crusts to foods with no grain products in them. While it is true that there is a certain group of people who suffer from celiac disease, a severe allergy to gluten, such an allergy afflicts only a small percentage of the population. If such a severe allergy afflicted the majority of the population, then most people would suffer from malnutrition due to destroyed intestinal lining that left them unable to absorb nutrients from ingested food. Our species has been eating wheat in a variety of forms for thousands of years, and yet we have not experienced widespread intestinal problems and malnutrition for thousands of years due to eating wheat. Furthermore, just because some people possess an allergy to gluten does not mean that gluten is unfit for human consumption. Some people possess allergies to nuts, fruits, and shellfish, which are all a part of the paleo diet, but that does not then make these foods unhealthy for the rest of the population who don't suffer from these particular food allergies. The term gluten sensitivity is a bit problematic in that it has no defined clinical meaning. Celiac disease is typically diagnosed via a small bowel biopsy, which reveals damaged microvilli of the intestines due to the allergic response, and blood tests for the presence of certain autoantibodies. People with celiac disease tend to have other autoimmune diseases, such as type 1 diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, or lupus. Gluten sensitivity has no such diagnostic criteria as of yet. What is sensitivity? How do you define sensitivity if not with some noticeable immune response? If a person removes highly processed junk food containing gluten from his or her diet and feels better, is this what is meant by gluten sensitivity? By that definition, we are all gluten sensitive. Pushing the idea of gluten sensitivity on the wider population certainly benefits food manufacturers who charge $5 for a loaf of bread made from rice flour. Gluten-free is big business. While people who suffer from a true allergy to wheat will benefit from the label, the term gluten-free appearing on the boxes of cookies and frozen pizza functions more as an advertising gimmick that gives the consumer the illusion that they are buying a health food and allows companies to increase the price of anything from breakfast cereals to burritos. Another important point to make is that gluten is a protein, not a carbohydrate, as one does not develop allergies to carbohydrates. Gluten is simply the plant's protein store. The fact that gluten is in carbohydrates is not an admonishment of carbohydrates. In fact, there are many grains that do not contain gluten, like rice, quinoa, and teff. Likewise, other starchy foods, like legumes and potatoes, do not contain gluten. 
It's amusing to see the current phobia surrounding gluten, as gluten was revered as a health food for decades and is still a popular meat substitute for vegans and vegetarians called seitan or wheat roast. This product is a way for those who do not eat meat to get protein into their diet. A key argument made by the paleo diet is that homo sapiens are not genetically adapted to eating a diet rich in starchy foods. This argument is not supported by scientific evidence in any way and in fact runs contrary to the very concept of evolution. Organisms adapt to a changing environment. Even before our species learned how to boil water and thus cook grains, they threw tubers into the fire which allowed them to have access to the glucose stored in these plants. Homo sapiens have enzymes specifically for starch digestion, namely salivary and pancreatic amylase. When our species learned to boil water, they then had access to an entire new food source, long chains of glucose polymers that proved highly advantageous. The brain's preferred source of fuel is glucose. The skeletal muscle takes up the glucose ingested and uses it for energy immediately or stores it in the form of glycogen for later use. Glycogen is structurally similar to starch. Both exist as long chains of glucose. Functionally, starch and glycogen are also similar, with starch being the carbohydrate energy store of plants and glycogen being the carbohydrate energy store for muscles. That our species isn't genetically adapted to the starch in grains, beans, legumes, and potatoes is completely without scientific merit. That we should be eating a diet our ancestors did over a million years ago because we cannot genetically adapt to a new food source goes against the fundamentals of evolutionary biology. Essentially, the paleo diet says that our species cannot adapt to environmental change through natural selection. It's an argument similar to intelligent design. It is difficult to imagine that any scientific hypothesis would hinge upon the idea that the major innovations of our species are something that have hurt us and things we should now abandon. It's difficult to imagine any scientist advocating a diet of ancestors who were unable to make the kind of cognitive advances our own species did and are now extinct. Only Homo sapiens advanced to the Upper Paleolithic period and only Homo sapiens became what we call behaviorally modern, capable of abstract thought and complex problem solving. And of course all this happened while Homo sapiens ate starch, first by throwing tubers into a fire and eventually by boiling water and cooking grains, beans, and legumes. Instead of looking at starches as our downfall, there is more reason to believe that the ability to cook grains, beans, and legumes is an event equal to shaping stone tools and controlling fire, each of which extended our diet to the benefit of our species. The fact that what anthropologists call the Great Leap Forward or the Mind's Big Bang occurred around the same time as the ability to boil water is significant, and there is evidence to suggest that this ability to have access to this entirely new food supply played a critical role in our transition to behaviorally modern Homo sapiens. This is a topic we will explore in depth in future presentations. By invoking the concept of evolution, the paleo diet has the flavor of a scientific diet perfectly formulated for our body's needs. However, the paleo diet is built on a faulty view of evolution, namely that it stopped instead of being an ongoing process. It's largely irrelevant to modern Homo sapiens what our paleolithic ancestors ate because evolution didn't stop during the paleolithic period. Like any other living organism, Homo sapiens have the ability to adapt to their environment and to new food sources. Depending on how far back in history you want to examine, you can find ancestors that ate mainly fruits, nuts, insects, and eggs, and little in the way of meats. The development of stone tools then allowed our ancestors to access meat, thus changing the composition of their diet. The ability to boil water and cook grains, beans, tubers, and other starches is simply another innovation that allowed our species to take advantage of yet another food source that proved to be so advantageous we went to the trouble of learning to cultivate these foods. A recent paper in the journal Nature described how the adaptation to starch played a key role in the domestication of dogs something that occurred in a relatively short period of time, mere tens of thousands of years, not millions. 
This runs contrary to Cordain's belief that Homo sapiens have not and cannot adapt to eating a diet rich in starchy foods like grains over thousands of years. If scientists have used genomic analysis to prove that dogs adapted to eating starch in a relatively short period of time, then it follows that our own species can and did as well. Why is starch important anyway? What does it matter whether or not your diet includes starch? Starch provides the body with a rich source of glucose, which can be used as fuel for muscles immediately or stored for later use in the form of glycogen. The liver is the body's main source of stored glycogen, and hormones act upon the liver to release glucose molecules from the stored glycogen in between meals or during fasting in order to maintain blood glucose levels. Starch is also a critical source of energy for the brain. The brain of adult mammals normally uses glucose as fuel and stores only a limited amount of glycogen and must constantly rely upon blood glucose for energy. This is why a drop in blood glucose is very dangerous. Starch is quite literally brain food. The glucose is oxidized via glycolysis, which provides the ATP used to create and maintain an electrical potential across the plasma membrane of neurons. A diet rich in starchy foods helps the body to stay out of ketosis, a potentially dangerous condition experienced by anyone eating a diet deficient in carbohydrates. A diet rich in starchy foods also helps to control weight by providing adequate calories and an overall feeling of satiety, as indicated by a measurement called the satiety index, which ranks foods based on their perceived level of satiety. Boiled potatoes ranks as the most satiating food on the planet, well above any protein or fat-rich food. As described in another presentation available on our channel, a diet rich in starch is likely to be low in fat, which enhances carbohydrate metabolism via the glucose fatty acid cycle. Instead of avoiding carbohydrates in favor of protein and fat, a diet rich in carbohydrates, especially boiled starches, has been shown to alleviate insulin resistance. Insulin's main job is to enable muscle cells to take up glucose from the blood after a meal. When fat dominates as a fuel source, carbohydrate metabolism is suppressed and insulin receptor signaling is suppressed. In other words, muscles do not receive a signal to take up glucose from the blood when fat serves as a major source of calories, as is the case in most low-carb diets. According to the Paleo diet, one should eat a variety of lean meats as a source of protein. However, our ancestors during the Paleolithic era didn't exactly go for lean chicken breast and flank steak. They were not remotely choosy about the type of meat they ate. Not only did they consume fatty organ meats and needed to do so in order to avoid the protein ceiling, they used stone tools to break open bones to gain access to the fatty marrow inside. Where is bone marrow on the menu of the Paleo diet? Fat is difficult to come by in nature, especially in plants. While the Paleo diet recommends a variety of plant oils, there obviously weren't any oils at this point in history. Our ancestors went through the painstaking process of cracking open the shells of nuts and seeds in order to consume the protein and fat inside. As for avoiding dairy, it's hard to believe that our ancestors would have shunned drinking the milk of any animal. Why would they have refused such a rich source of calories? The Maasai, modern hunter-gatherers, in fact, do just that. While the paleo diet says to avoid sugars, it fails to mention that fruits contain sugar. That's why they taste sweet. Contrary to the media's perception of sugar, it is not toxic and is not the sole driver of obesity. Glucose is a sugar, and it is the major source of fuel for the brain, and fructose, a sugar found in both fruits and vegetables, can be converted to glucose, so any attempt to demonize sugar fails to account for this basic fact of human biochemistry. Cordain also claims that hunter-gatherers exhibit no signs of atherosclerosis despite having a diet rich in animal products, but this is in fact disputed by published research. In an article published in the American Journal of Epidemiology, Researchers showed that the Maasai do show signs of advanced atherosclerosis, but have adapted over thousands of years by developing large arteries to compensate. 
to extrapolate from a population that has adapted to a certain set of environmental conditions by recommending the same diet to sedentary Americans who have experienced no such selective pressure for thousands of years is a dangerous and irresponsible message. Cordain's paleo diet is not a new idea. The concept of returning to a diet devoid of modern junk food was proposed by Dr. Eaton Boyd in 1989 in a book called The Paleolithic Prescription, a program of diet and exercise and a design for living. However, this differs dramatically from Cordain's version of a paleolithic diet in that Boyd's version contained starches like whole grain bread and legumes and was a low-fat diet. It seems as though there is no certainty as to what a paleolithic diet actually is, and this is a point worth repeating. As mentioned earlier, there is no one diet that can be called the Paleolithic diet, a fact that Cordain admits in his published research, but then ignores by dismissing the diets that do not fit with his preconceived ideal diet. Why do Boyd's Paleolithic prescription and Cordain's Paleo diet differ with regards to starch consumption? The Paleolithic period is in the past, so nothing has changed about what our ancestors ate. Like Cordain, Boyd's position is that Homo sapiens have not adapted to agriculture, and thus grains are suspect and are most likely the basis for modern chronic diseases, called diseases of civilization. Why is this idea being recycled into a more extremist version? One reason is that Cordain's paleo diet fits with the modern tendency to blame carbohydrates for our current obesity epidemic while absolving the role of fat. Despite the fact that almost every modern junk food contains a substantial amount of fat, Cordain makes the mistake of many scientists by ignoring history and epidemiological data that reveals the benefits of a starch-based diet and chooses to equate french fries with potatoes and soda with fruit juice. The current environment that is nothing short of macarbtheism is now adding to the rise in dangerous ketogenic diets that puts the health of the dieter at risk for the sake of quick weight loss results that rarely last and more often than not lead to the dieter putting back on even more weight, creating the vicious cycle known as yo-yo dieting. The paleo diet is certainly not unique in its anti-carbohydrate stance. Like many other diets, Barry Sears the Zone Diet, the Atkins Diet, or the Gary Tobbs Diet, that can be described as Atkins on steroids, going so far as to demonize all carbohydrates, even most fruits, the paleo diet teaches the dieter to be afraid of carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are suspect, despite our dependence on them from anything from basic brain functioning to athletic performance. Using glycemic index, which is the ultimate tool of all macarbtheites, these diets equate all spikes in blood sugar as bad and all spikes in insulin as dysfunctional. The fact of the matter is, blood sugar always rises after a meal that includes carbohydrates, and insulin is the hormone that then regulates blood sugar by stimulating muscles to take up this fuel and use it right away or to store it as glycogen. Only in the event of low metabolic demand and full glycogen stores will the body use glucose to make fat. Carbohydrates do not equal fat metabolically or biochemically. Fat equals fat. The slick salesmanship of anti-carbohydrate diets have left a deep impact on the public's perception of carbohydrates, and unfortunately it is not only scientifically inaccurate, but it has served to fuel a rise in the consumption of fat as some sort of free food with no real caloric consequences, despite being over two times as calorically dense. After athletes scoffed at a diet that didn't include starch, Cordain decided to come out with the paleo diet for athletes, which includes the very foods to which we are supposedly not genetically adapted. As it turns out, our bodies are highly adapted to starch, so much so that the original paleo diet is essentially a losing diet for anyone seeking to run longer or faster and to improve their overall athletic performance. The fact that there has to be a separate diet for athletes disproves the basic premise of the paleo diet. How can we not be adapted to something that offers such an advantage? Did our ancestors not need to run and perform physical exercise to secure food? Of course they did, and of course we are adapted to eating starchy foods, and the paleo diet for athletes proves it. With the addition of starch, the paleo diet for athletes is not much different from any other diet that recommends a nutrient-dense diet while avoiding junk food. 
There is nothing unique or radical about such a diet, and its message differs little from the recommendations made by the USDA or the American Dietetic Association. The radical vision that Cordain sells the paleo followers is the same run-of-the-mill nutritional advice that registered dietitians have been espousing for decades. The paleo diet, like all anti-carbohydrate diets, forces dieters to the top of the food chain by recommending a diet that nears the maximum amount of protein the body can handle. This high consumption of meat is an unsustainable diet with a list of undesirable consequences for the planet and most of its inhabitants. A diet that is high in protein is only relevant for a wealthy minority. Eating high on the food chain translates into using more and more land to grow crops to feed animals instead of people, which means that much of the world's population will be left without access to affordable food. Eating high on the food chain is also dangerous for the planet. Forests are destroyed to make room for growing animal feed and to make room for cattle to graze. It is also worth mentioning that the concentration of toxins found in the environment increases as one travels up the food chain, which means that a diet rich in meat makes one more susceptible to consuming potentially toxic amounts of any environmental contaminants that may be present within the ecosystem. The paleo diet is based on a vague notion that our ancestors, although Cordain is never specific about which ancestors, enjoyed superior health free from the modern chronic diseases. It's a good idea to point out that our ancestors did not enjoy a long life expectancy with few living past the age of 40. This is important considering that many of the chronic diseases Cordain mentions, heart disease, obesity, diabetes, and arthritis, would not have time to develop in species with such a short lifespan and who lived a harsh lifestyle that would have weeded out people who were more susceptible to disease. What seems to go unaccounted for in the paleo diet's mythologizing about the past is the fact that our ancestors ate starchy foods long before the advent of agriculture. Even before learning to boil water to cook grains, our ancestors threw starchy tubers into the fire, breaking the starch into shorter chains of glucose molecules, a useful food source. In order to end the romance with our ancestors that is built upon the idea that our ancestors lived disease-free, perfectly healthy lives, hunting and gathering in a virtual Garden of Eden, we have to confront the actual scientific evidence that reveals the essential role of starchy foods in our evolution. Not only are these foods critical to providing skeletal muscle with energy and regulating blood glucose levels, but they also provide a key source of energy to fuel the brain. To deny this is to deny basic human biology and evolution. What Cordain does an excellent job of revealing is the weakness of the hunter-gatherer diet, namely the constant threat of protein toxicity. Agriculture solves this problem permanently for the species, allowing for ample and consistent consumption of carbohydrates, enabling Homo sapiens to move away from an animal-based diet and a lifestyle that was nutritionally precarious. So far, we've seen how the paleo diet is not new, nor is it unique in its criticism of carbohydrates or junk food. It's a diet that is so deleterious to athletic performance that another version of it for athletes had to be invented to make up for the fact that starch is key to athletic performance. Any diet that pushes protein consumption towards the upper limit of what is possible without toxicity is unsustainable and irrelevant for most people on the planet. Finally, the paleo diet is highly disputed by other scientists, including Harvard's Richard Wrangham, who asserts that carbohydrates, including starchy roots and tubers, played a key role in the diet of our Paleolithic ancestors. Without a doubt, there is one thing that the paleo diet is, and that is profitable. Cordain offers paleo membership fees ranging from $49 for a one-year membership to $89 for a three-year membership that includes access to webinars, newsletters, podcasts, and an entire community of people who have all decided to go paleo. There are books and DVDs about anything from treating acne to multiple sclerosis with the paleo diet, none of which has been properly evaluated by the medical community. Furthermore, promoting a cure for all diseases of civilization by way of the paleo diet takes advantage of desperate people who don't have the scientific background to be able to take a more critical look at Cordain's claims. The paleo diet seems to be insulated from criticism because it promotes fruits and vegetables. 
However, every diet that is promoted by the medical and scientific community advocates the consumption of fruits and vegetables, as well as lean meats, nuts, and oils in moderation. The only real uniqueness of the paleo diet is its weakness, and that is the lack of starch. Instead of getting behind an idea that celebrates metabolic and environmental inefficiency as well as pseudoscience, it's time to call an end to this dangerous fad diet in honor of our ancestors, who recognized an invaluable source of energy when they tasted it. I hope that this presentation has at the very least given you something to think about regarding the paleo diet's premise. I also hope that this presentation highlights how our society regards the nutritional sciences. Unlike other scientific disciplines, most people learn what little they know about nutrition from celebrity diets and from the unscrupulous diet industry who loves an uneducated public. The need to rotate diet fads is just as compulsive as the need to forsake one fashion trend for another. This is quite evident with the popularity of the paleo diet now eclipsing that of the Atkins diet or of the South Beach diet, which both seem to have outlived their 15 minutes of pseudoscience fame. Instead of viewing nutrition from the perspective of the diet industry, it is time for the public to see nutrition as a science that isn't subject to fads. Gravity is not a fad that can be dismissed one day and adopted the next. Likewise, sound nutritional guidelines are not built upon fads, but upon years of scientific inquiry and evidence. One can't rewrite the rules of human metabolism to suit a diet any more than one can rewrite the laws of motion to suit a gymnastics trick. Homo sapiens are starch eaters and have adapted through natural selection quite well to eating grains, potatoes, and legumes. From a scientific standpoint, to say anything otherwise is akin to promoting intelligent design. Short of wanting to be a pawn in the fad diet culture that rules the American mindset as well as their waistlines, there is no reason to go paleo.